Hello, this is Aaron, and welcome back to the podcast. You know, I thought about taking the time between Christmas and New Year's off from podcasting, which a lot of people do. But since I missed a week two weeks ago because I wasn't feeling well, uh, I decided I would go ahead and do this one because I want to be doing the work, uh, as they say. I hope everybody had a Merry Christmas. I'm going to be honest, I didn't have the best Christmas that I've ever had uh, this year. In fact, this was not one of the better Christmas seasons, Advent seasons in general, uh, because we were sick so much. So both my wife and I were probably sick half of Advent with a head cold. Now, maybe it was COVID. We didn't get tested, uh, but just seemed like a classic head cold to me. Uh, you know, I didn't see any what I would call COVID symptoms like fevers and all that kind of stuff. Uh, so that really had us kind of under the weather. Uh, one of the things we like to do is sing Christmas carols every day uh, as part of our bedtime routine with our son. But that was even hard to do uh, because my voice was shot and I was trying to conserve my voice for podcasting other things. And man, I could, couldn't really sing. It was hurting uh, and it just wasn't feeling well the whole time. Uh, so that was part of it. Then we got the COVID booster shots. Uh, that's actually the reason that I uh, was unable to do the podcast. The COVID booster, I mean, put me flat on my back. I actually got it on a Saturday uh, around noon. Sunday, I was completely out of commission. I probably was was asleep 20 hours on Sunday. And Monday, I was still feeling so bad uh, that I was unable to even do a podcast. So that wasn't good. And then... Christmas Eve, early morning Christmas Eve, my wife came down with some kind of a stomach bug, some kind of a stomach virus. So she has essentially been bedridden uh, Christmas Eve, Christmas Day, and then much of today, which is Sunday. And uh, so that hasn't been pleasant. We didn't get to spend Christmas with our family. She didn't really get to enjoy it, that's for sure. And in fact, uh, the reason I came in, it's actually Sunday night. My podcast studio is in a co-working facility Um you know, very close to my house. Uh, and so I came over here after my son went to bed in order to record the podcast so that tomorrow uh, I'd be able to work from home uh, if I need to be. Uh, you, you know, all I need to do is really record this thing and I can do everything else tomorrow. So, uh, you know, be as it may. I hope you guys had a Merry Christmas. And the fact is we have so much to be thankful for, so much to be blessed about. Uh, you know, some of these bugs that we've gotten in the grand scheme of things, when so many people have suffered so much from COVID and other things, uh, it's really more of an annoyance uh, than a serious problem, to tell you the truth. This is also, I should say, the first podcast that I'm going to be creating transcript for, uh, for the subscriber program, uh, or at least that's the plan. Uh, the service that I'm going to use for it, uh, I haven't actually tried it yet, so it's going to be the first one I try. It's an AI-based transcription system, uh, so it won't be 100% perfect. I've seen some other ones that have used this, and it's it's basically pretty good. You can, you know, read through and whatever. Uh, so look forward to that. In fact, I've, uh, I'm going to be doing the subscribers. Of course, members are, are included as subscribers, too, on Substack. So I'm migrating a lot of stuff to Substack, and in fact, I've almost got it ready to go. Uh, I, you know, I'd mentioned that I'd recorded audio versions of the first 20 issues, the masculinist, those are all loaded, ready to go. So I'll be loading up uh, everybody into the system this week. So you'll probably be getting a message uh, about that. Hopefully you'll have those 20, uh, we'll have the 20 ready to go. Hopefully you'll have the transcript of this one ready to go. And then for subscribers, you'll get exclusive content as well. And again, through the end of the uh, month, it's only $5 a month. January 1st, price for a subscriber goes up to $10 a month. And again, I won't I won't go too much into that because you guys have heard me give the pitch before. Uh, again, running a special uh, through the end of the year. The member program is going to be 35 through the end of the month and then going up to 50. And I just want to throw out one teaser. Uh, if you haven't quite made the decision that you want to sign up yet, uh, you know, I did a ton of research uh, for the Masculinist Project before I even started it. A lot of that material is unpublished. I essentially have a book's worth of material or maybe more, sitting on my hard drive that's never been published. And one of the things that I did is wrote an almost 20,000-word review and detailed analysis of Tim and Kathy Keller's book, The Meaning of Marriage. And this is unpublished. It will almost certainly never be published. I've only shared it with like five total people, I think. And if you remember, I'm not going to share it with you, but what I am going to do is go through in a book discussion format um, a lot of that material. So I'll go through it. So if you're interested in it, uh, you'll definitely want to sign up for that. I'll probably be doing that in February 
uh, because I want to give everybody the opportunity to buy and read the book if they want to do it. It's a widely, widely touted uh, marriage book, maybe the most touted marriage book uh, in Protestant circles. So we'll be doing a deep dive on Tim and Kathy Keller's The Meaning of Marriage. That's one of the things we do in the member program. Uh, so stay tuned for that. Again, please sign up. Uh, and, uh, you know, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that uh, as we roll out the program. So anyway, what do you talk about the week between Christmas and New Year's? You know, there's things in the news I could have talked about. Uh, on Christmas Day, uh, the Twitter account of the site 538, which is Nate Silver, the, you know, statistician who does a lot of election predictions, they're actually tweeting requests for people who had abortions. If you've had an abortion, uh, please get in contact us. We'd love to tell you. Great Christmas Day uh, message. Uh, for that, uh, you know, so there's all kinds of little things like that. But I decided to go back to something I've been meaning to do since Columbus Day, which is to talk more about this idea of passing on our patrimony. And many of us are probably thinking about New Year rest resolutions, thinking about stuff we want to do for 2022. And this might be something, especially if you have kids, that you'll want to think about. So I did a previous podcast uh, in early November where I talked about uh, the hymns and how we need to make sure we can pass on the great English language hymns as our patrimony. I also talked about celebrating All Saints Day and Reformation Day and thinking about all the people who've gone before us in the faith, which Protestants are pretty disconnected to. Catholics, again, do a much better job of that. If you're Catholic, you're probably not celebrating Reformation Day, but you probably are doing All Saints Day, and so that's great. And, and this is one, though, that, that actually occurred to me first and it was on Columbus Day. So, you know, Columbus Day is very controversial these days. And a lot of people basically tout this idea that, look, Columbus Day was not a holiday until the early 1900s. Uh, it was there as sort of a sop to Italian-American immigrants. And it was really an Italian holiday for that. It's not some ancient American tradition, so we can safely jettison it. And it's true that Columbus Day, as we understand it, I think it officially became a holiday in 1905, but it may have been first proclaimed as like a one-time holiday in the very late 1800s after some Italian-Americans were uh, lynched or murdered or something down in New Orleans. Uh, so they're like, well, you know, there's a lot of anti-Catholic violence at that time, Excuse me, probably anti-Catholic in general, anti-Italian in particular. And so, um, you know, this was part of that, and it was sort of an Italian-American thing. But that really misses, I think, uh, a great deal of the story. You know, Christopher Columbus and his association with the United States is something that goes way back. For example, how many um, cities in America are named Columbus? I think there's like a Columbus in pretty much every state in America. Columbus, Ohio is the state capital of Ohio. I think it was artificially created as a state capital. They named it Columbus. And, you know, as somebody pointed out, uh, as well, uh, during that time, all this, uh, uh, you know, controversy over uh, Columbus Day. So look, the name Columbia uh, is a name that refers sometimes to the whole New World, but specifically to the United States, going back for a very, very long way. That's why we have, for example, a District of Columbia uh, as our nation's capital. Why do we have a District of Columbia? Because Columbia is the United States. Uh, so all these things we see uh, that are named Columbia are really after the United States. So, you know, Columbia Pictures, Columbia Records, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Columbia was just a name for America, obviously associated with Christopher Columbus. And that's something that a lot of people don't think about and don't, don't get. Also, uh, which you may not know, Columbia was the female... Uh, symbol or representation of the United States. Back in the 19th century, there was this trend towards having um, a, uh, you know, a female symbol sort of represent the nation. So there was Britannia, Germania, some of these, and Columbia was the symbol of the United States. And so I'm going to, for those of you who are on YouTube, I am going to put up an image of Columbia. This is actually a recruiting poster, but if you don't have it in, on, on YouTube and you just go to Google and Google for Columbia symbol of the United States, click over to the images tab, um, you will see it. Now, 
Colombia, as the symbol of the United States, essentially went completely uh, out of fashion. And, and essentially, I don't know that it was ever really anything after World War II, uh, because there was this, uh, you know, very successful effort to essentially rebrand the United States around the Statue of Liberty. Uh, so the Statue of Liberty, that famous Emma Lazarus poem, you know, the give me your tired huddled masses, that was added later to the Statue of Liberty. And that sort of, um, uh, you know, sort of recapitulating of the Statue of Liberty as defining America as a nation of immigrants and sort of re becoming the symbol of the United States uh, was really part of, uh, you know, essentially, essentially redefining the country in light of the Ellis Island era of immigration uh, that represented essentially a major redefinition of the country. I think prior to, you know, the 1920s, this really was essentially considered a, you know, an Anglo-American or Anglo-British uh, type of uh, polity. And that's where the people were predominantly British. I mean, there were some Germans and there were some Irish and there were people like, but predominantly British. Uh, and as we had this mass influx of immigrants, we sort of redefined that uh, around the nation of immigrants. And by the way, I'm selling you this as someone who's, you know, got Ellis Island uh, blood in my veins. Uh, it's just sort of factual. So this this Columbia imagery sort of went by the wayside. I think it's interesting. My understanding is that the Statue of Liberty, which of course was a gift from the nation of France, was actually uh, a representation of the uh, female symbol of France, which is Marianne. And of all these sort of like female symbols of the nation, whom I believe were supposed to be representatives of the goddess Athena, they were supposed to maybe embody the goddess Athena, Marianne is the only one that's still left. In fact, you still see Marianne frequently displayed uh, in, um, in France. So if you hold on just a second, I'm going to pull up uh, again a separate tab here. And for those of you who are online, you'll be able to see this symbol, uh, which is the tricolor of France, uh, blue, white, red. Only the white is essentially a silhouette of a woman, which I believe is Marianne. And it says Liberté, Egalité, Fraternité. You will often see this particular logo as sort of a placard uh, on a podium where French officials, French government officials are speaking. Sort of like you might see, you know, uh, you, you know the, uh, the the presidential seal, right, on the on the presidential thing. It's right there, uh, and oddly, uh, that's kind of their symbol, and that's sort of our symbol too, uh, because um, we are, you know, as now the Statue of Liberty has sort of become the female embodiment uh, of the United States. So, what I just told you there, though, about this idea of Colum Columbia is a very old name for the United States. There's a very long association between the United States and Christopher Columbus. Uh, you know, obviously, you know. Uh, you know, the one thing that you would still see, I should say today, the one embodiment of kind of Columbia that you see is Columbia Pictures. And if you see the, the Indian with Columbia Pictures, there's this woman holding a torch, and that is a representation of Columbia. So that's the last of anybody really sees of her uh, today's in America. And again, what I sort of just told you about this is what I call Wikipedia tier knowledge. So I'm not claiming to be some great expert uh, on the history of this. Uh, in, in fact, though, I do think Wikipedia, although it has its problems and I would never rely on it as an authoritative source, having Wikipedia tier knowledge of things uh, is actually pretty good. And one of the things I think about, again, is, is I think about the things my son needs to know, making sure he has Wikipedia tier knowledge of a lot more things than I did growing up, uh, I think would be good. I'll tell you another story uh, before we get back to uh, Columbia. Uh, I think it was probably like, again, 12 years ago. It wasn't that long ago. I mean, it wasn't yesterday. It, was, it wasn't that long ago. I was over at a relative's house, and this person had left the Catholic Church and did not have a great, um, you know, a great view of the Catholic Church. You know, my whole family is Catholic, right, except for basically me and a few other people, my mom and, and all that. So this is one of the few people who had left the Catholic Church. And a, you know, a cousin of hers had given her a business card, and on this business card was printed on the back the Ten Commandments. She's like, look at this. Look at this. So I'm like, look again. I'm like, what are you talking about? Like, look what they took out. The Catholics got rid of the Second Commandment about images, no graven images, 
because they want to worship, you know, idols and statues and stuff like that. And I'm like, now, you know, I'm not an expert on the Catholic theology, but, you know, that just didn't even pass the sniff test to me, right? I'm like, when I know Catholic Church, they do not worship idols. They don't worship statues and all that stuff. They got a lot of statues, but they don't worship them. And I'm like, well, what's, what's this? And, you know, I looked up, and I'm embarrassed to say, well, I shouldn't be embarrassed to say, it just happened. I did not know that Catholics and Protestants had different lists of the Ten Commandments. I had no idea. And if you go to Wikipedia, again, and type in Ten Commandments, you will actually see all the different versions. There's more than one version. Uh, and it has nothing to do with the Catholics trying to get rid of the idea of getting rid of graven images. But basically, in the Catholic version, uh, what Protestants know as, as the first two commandments, uh, you know, you know uh, essentially, thou shalt have another God before me and don't make any graven images, are combined into one. And then what we know as the Tenth Commandment about not coveting is split into two. There's like, don't covet your neighbor's wife and don't covet your neighbor's stuff. And, you know, now that once I figure this out, I'm like, ah, that, that you know, helps explain you know, all the kind of jokes about not coveting your neighbor's ass and stuff that I remember from my kids. It didn't really resonate because I'm like, well, why, why would, you know, you break that out? Because only one coveting. But basically it's different. It has to do with the different origins of it. Um, and, and so I think that the, uh, I think that the, the, the Protestant one sort of follows the Septuagint, which was the uh, Greek, Greek New Testament. And I think the Eastern Orthodox actually used the same list. You know, the Catholics derive from Augustine. I think the Lutherans actually are much closer to the Catholic, although, you know, if you go there, there's like tons of them. The Jews got a completely different one. So there's like lots of different Ten Commandments. And imagine spending every Sunday, uh, twice a day in church, and Wednesday night on church, all growing up, attending church all this time, and never once having anybody tell me, oh, by the way, Catholics and Protestants don't use the same list of Ten Commandments. I mean, you might not have even known that. I'm like, how could I have not have known that? And again, I feel like there's a lot I learned. Um, you know, I, and I learned so much in this kind of uh, you know fundamentalist upbringing I had about the Bible. But there's so much I didn't know, so much I didn't learn. And so I feel like, man, that's one that would be very good to know. I think like church history, gotta have at least a capsule knowledge of church history, or you know, you're gonna get you know ambushed by that. I think it'd be very good to. Uh, you know, give your kids a basic understanding of the different authorship and dating controversies around the Bible. I mean, I think it'd be very easy. I was definitely an adult before I even heard that there were any disputes about who wrote the books of the Bible. I mean, that's, you, you just cannot allow someone to go off to college. I, my, I didn't hear this in college, but like go off to college and have some professor ambush your kid who's been raised in the church and never heard that there's disputes about the authorship and have them completely undermine your faith. So that's why what I call it, just having basic Wikipedia tier knowledge of something like the Ten Commandments and all these differences is actually very good. So that's good. So I'm done with that, and I want to come back because when I was hearing this guy talk about Columbia's, Columbia in the United States, the first thing that popped into my head was the song Columbia, the Gem of the Ocean, which is a great patriotic song was written, uh, you know, in the mid 1800s. It was one of the, you know, few tunes that was sort of an unofficial national anthem of the United States, and uh, up until they they uh, picked the Star Spangled Banner, and just a great little song. And it reminded me, I mean, wait a minute, you know, when I was in grade school, we had music class once a week, and this wasn't like band. We weren't learning instruments. But, you know, we would listen to records and, like, hear different genres of music. It was sort of music exposure. And in retrospect, I think about that now. You know, and I grew up in a rural school that people would say was not very good, not very highly rated, for sure. Uh, and yet there's so much basic knowledge that I got there. And one of the things that, that I got out of this is this music class that I had in elementary school growing up is our music teacher, Mrs. Brown, taught us all of these patriotic songs and all of these folk songs about America. And I'm thinking to myself, man, what are the odds that kids going to school today, want to hear a lot of kids don't have music class anymore, but like, what are the odds that your school is teaching your kids all these great patriotic songs uh, that are part of our cultural patrimony and 
uh, and really teach them to you. I bet they're not teaching your kids how to sing Dixie, uh, for example. But a lot of these things have just been gone. You're probably maybe learning this land is your land, but maybe you're not even learning that. Who knows? But, you know, we can't just assume that the schools, not the public school system for sure, and maybe not even like some of these classical Christian schools. I don't know what they teach, but, you know, I think they're very into like Latin and stuff like that. Maybe not as much into essentially the American cultural patrimony, because that might seem too much like Christian nationalism. Again, I don't know for sure, because uh, my kid's not in school yet. But I was thinking, man, this is something I want to make sure gets passed on, that my son uh, learns all of these great patriotic songs and all of these folk songs. Now, some of the folk songs um, that we have uh, are, um, I, he is learning them, because like a lot of kids, uh, little toys and things will play songs. And like, so you'll hear like, you know, the Camp Town Races, uh, for example, little songs like that. So it's already been a little, a lot of songs uh, that he's learned. So maybe kids do learn them, but like, maybe they don't. And interestingly, I mentioned this to my wife, and she had never heard the song, Columbia, Gem of the Ocean. And I'm like, wow, they didn't teach her that in school? Uh, that's kind of interesting. Now, maybe she had heard it, and just my rendition of that uh, wasn't very good. So what I'm going to do, I'm actually going to play you the first verse of the song, Columbia, the Gem of the Ocean. Now, the recording I'm going to use is a not very good mono recording from like 1921, Victor Records recording that I found on YouTube. And why am I doing that? It's because I want to be careful around copyright. I mean, the, the music companies are some of the most aggressive on copyright. And so maybe nothing would happen. I think it's fair use to, for me to play a verse of a song and make a commentary about it. Uh, but you never know what one of these algorithms is going to say. So um, hold on for just a second, and I am going to... Uh, bring in here uh, the song, uh, Columbia, the Gem of the Ocean, and we're going to play uh, the first verse of this song. <laughs> second here there we go that's columbia gem of the ocean it's actually a great song very catchy tune now those of my british friends who are listening to this you might be saying hey all right, wait a minute that song is called britannia the pride of the ocean or something like that and it's true that there's a very similar uh, british song with the same tune now ordinarily when it happens that there's a british song and an american song with the same tune the british song came first and the american tune was the copy so you can think about that with the song America, My Country, Tis of Thee. Um, in this case, again, using that authority uh, for all knowledge, Wikipedia, uh, it's not clear. This is much more ambiguous. We don't really know for certain uh, which one was first. And you can read the different authorship controversies around this on Wikipedia. When I came away from it was, uh, it sounds kind of like the American version was probably first. The main argument for why the British version was first is back then nobody would ever have, you know, uh, referred to America as essentially like a naval power. You know, the, the ocean, this oceanic uh, concept of America and the lyrics didn't seem to make a lot of sense. Anyhow, you, you can read about it, but, you know, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and claim this song for us. And there are a lot of songs like this. Uh, you, you know, Grand Old Flag is another one that you, you might not know, which I think is from a Broadway show uh, in the early 20th century. And again, there's a lot of folk songs and a lot of patriotic songs out there that I think would be great for kids to know. And so I'm going to put a resource for you in the show notes. There's a, uh, a site called Scout Songs uh, that put together a list of patriotic songs uh, that look very interesting. 
And so I'm going to put a link to that in the show notes, and you can pull that up. And there's a list of songs that you can make sure your kids from know. And maybe the maybe the Boy Scouts, uh, for example, would have been a place that would have taught your kids songs like this. Maybe this would have been another venue for people to learn patriotic songs. But uh, I would not trust the Boy Scouts for anything today. It's it's totally uh, kind of sad. But you know, basically, the organization is has become almost completely trashed uh, today. I hate to say it. And yes, I know some people, you're into scouting, and if you're running a scout troop and you're the scout master and you're keeping a firm you know, eye on things, it's probably okay. So I don't want to diss people who are doing that. But again, I wouldn't even rely on the, the key is I would not rely on the Boy Scouts uh, today to teach your kid anything about American culture or American heritage. And this is one where, again, I think there's a tremendous effort being made to essentially sever us uh, from our cultural patrimony as Americans. And therefore, we as parents need to make sure that we are very consciously passing on our cultural patrimony for our children because the institutions that previously might have done this for us, like the public schools, like the Boy Scouts, you know, maybe even like a church Sunday school program, they're probably not doing it today. Right, they're probably not doing it today, or at least you can't assume that they're doing it. And even if they're doing it, they may be doing it in order to trash our cultural patrimony uh, in some way. And this is one that we have to do. We have to be much more intentional. And this gets to what I call the negative world. Uh, again, I have this framework: the positive, neutral, negative world in how society views Christianity. Used to view it positively, then we sort of had this phase where it's sort of viewed as a social neutral, and now we've moved into a, a negative world where in essence, Christianity and its moral code are viewed negatively and as a threat to the new social order. So in that environment, you know, the way that we used to be able to rely on essentially secular society to reinforce Christian moral norms, for example, or to reinforce kind of the cultural norms of Christianity, we just can't do that. You know, we have to be much more uh, intentional about passing on our cultural patrimony uh, in the way uh, that say Jews have had to do that as, as a minority culture or ethnic minorities in a country. We as Christians, whatever our ethnicity may be, are in essence now a moral minority in America. And so, you know, the Christian patrimony of the hymns and our things need to be passed on. And I just think even if you're just, you know, a regular American citizen, making sure that your children receive this great, amazing American cultural patrimony that we have, including these great patriotic songs all these great folk songs that people used to sing and know, uh, and have them in a very positive way and not in a negative way is something that we have to do because the, you know, kind of the powers that be in America, uh, you have, you know, have essentially declared war to some level on our own cultural patrimony. America is to be denigrated, not celebrated in many respects, certainly in the past. And many of these things have probably just been completely dropped. Again, my wife, who's generation X, by the way, she's, you know, it's not like just millennial. She had never heard Columbia, the gem of the ocean. So you could already see some of these things kind of fading away. Then again, let's be clear, right? Culture changes. Some of these things are not timeless traditions. They're not that old, you know, to begin with. And, you know, the idea that we'll all be seeing Columbia, the gem of the ocean, 500 years from now, probably not going to happen. And so there are always going to be kind of new things that come along and old things that kind of fall by the wayside. You know, the Boy Scouts are something that seems to be falling by the wayside. Nevertheless, I don't think we, that's like uh, a reason to just be blasé and cast aside uh, this great uh, heritage that we have. America has a great heritage. We do have a culture. We have a great culture. doesn't mean it's a flawless culture, uh, but uh, it's a culture that's ours and that we can love. And again, if you're listening overseas, I know I have a lot of overseas listeners, think about what this means in your context. context. Now, the, the idea of patriotic songs in a sense that America has patriotic songs, uh, may not be uh, one that you have, but you probably have folk songs. You have other traditional music uh, that maybe is being passed on, maybe it's not. So you have to think about, about what to do with you. But again, I just want to keep re returning to this theme, passing on your patrimony. We need to pass on the great patrimony of these great American patriotic and folk songs um, to our children. In 2022, as we're thinking about what we're going to do, this might be one to start adding to your child's um, educational plan. So again, thank you very much. And uh, as we roll out of here, I'll probably have the outro. I'll play the last two verses of 
uh, Columbia, Gem of the Ocean. I will talk to you next week. Oh, I'm